910 Ministries podcast, No Trash, Just Truth, with hosts Chris Paxson and Rose Spiller. At Proverbs 910 Ministries, we are dedicated to taking out the trash of false teaching and replacing it with biblical truth. Welcome back, everyone. Today, we start in chapter 17, which begins the final section of the book of Revelation. This is an extended vision of John's that goes through chapter 19, verse 10. Today, we'll cover chapter 17 and 18. And as we've seen so far, Satan the dragon not only uses deception, aka the false prophet, to wage war against Christ's church, he also uses violent persecution by the state, aka the beast. These beastly world governments, empowered by Satan, not only do evil against God's people, they also assume rights that only God has. And we think you're going to find a lot of relevant stuff today. I think so. Because this manifests itself in things like giving others the right to unjustly take life at will, like legalizing of abortion, or in the form of stepping in to meet the needs of people that the government rules over, resulting in its citizens looking to the government for help and sustenance rather than to God. Today, we see small businesses, restaurants, and other employers locked down under the guise of keeping citizens safe from a virus that has a 99% survival rate and it's causing widespread unemployment. This, while some bigger chain brand stores are allowed to remain open. Without the government's help, survival becomes harder and harder. But in order to get help, compliance with their rules is mandatory and throughout history, Following the rules has often constituted sinning, like participating in the trade guilds and their pagan rituals in John's day. Like I said, very relevant. For the same mostly bogus reasons, we're watching governments hinder worship practices like gathering together and singing while strip clubs are allowed to stay open. Thanksgiving, the United States' national day to give thanks to God, was strongly recommended to be canceled this year due to widely inflated and wrongly reported numbers of people who were getting the virus. The punishment for not obeying? Having your doors permanently closed, licenses revoked that you needed to operate with, or police showing up at your door during Thanksgiving dinner because your neighbors were encouraged to snitch on you when you had more than a few cars in your driveway. It's crazy. But the beast uses force to try to get people to comply. The dragon and the beast are counterfeit gods. They mimic God in some ways, but they fall woefully short. In chapters 17 and 18, we meet their counterfeit bride, Babylon, which represents power, wealth, glamour, fame, or anything of the sort that's tempting to chase after. Babylon is not only something the wicked are drawn to, she also seeks to entice the people of God away from their savior. Babylon's called a prostitute. This harlot and the beast work in tandem for a while. The harlot tries to entice God's people to comply with the world's standards through her temptations. Will the temptations of the prostitute bride be too great to withstand? Will the force of the beast cause us to sin against God? Or will the church stand firm following God's word, and be martyred? That's the question we're all going to have to ask ourselves. That's the question people have had to ask themselves. Absolutely. So let's start by reading 17, 1 to 6. This is titled, The Great Prostitute and the Beast. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So those things that entice us are personified as a prostitute known as Babylon. I know we've talked about this before, but Chris, why don't you elaborate on this a bit? 
Okay, the city of Babylon from the Old Testament was a city full of worldly sinful pleasures. Babylon's called a prostitute because she entices people to her worldly pleasures. She's not a pretty girl standing on a street corner minding her own business. She's a harlot seductively wooing people to her by showing off her goods and motioning to come in and buy. That's the picture that we see of Lady Folly from Proverbs, who's contrasted in that same book by Lady Wisdom. And Babylon is seated on many waters, meaning that her pleasures are offered worldwide, something that's backed up by verse 15, which says these waters are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. There's that four again, four things listed symbolizing the whole earth. Many, many leaders, world rulers, and governments crave what Babylon offers. And haven't we seen that? They're having an affair with her and they're drunk on it. And so are the wicked who are under her rule. We see that through all of history. Rulers and nations drunk with power and wealth. We see that today. We do. And it's not just a problem for the wicked. Believers have it too. No one escapes the temptation of the great prostitute. You know, Satan isn't our only adversary. We'd like to think the devil made me do it when we sin. But that's very likely not the case most of the time, if ever. Christians have three enemies, the world, our sinful flesh, and the devil. We don't most of the time, if ever, sin because of the devil. Whereas he's not omnipresent. He can't be tempting you and me and world rulers at the same time. And yes, he has demons under his control, but they don't even need to mess with us to get us to sin. Our sinful flesh leads us to sin more than anything else. And then there's the world, whether it's the enticements of pleasure from Babylon or government force or punishment that leads us to compromise because of our sinful flesh. God's people have always had the temptation to be drawn away from God and commit spiritual adultery. Read the Bible. Christians are used to being told not to worship idols, but our flesh wants a lot of things. We want comfort and pleasure and knowledge and a life free from pain, whether physical or emotional, or any number of things that may be good in and of themselves. They don't turn into idols for us until we put them ahead of God. When they become more important than following Jesus, we need to repent and we need to turn from them. Exactly. And pressures from the outside that tempt us to want these things more and more or powers that cause us to be deprived of these things only make it harder to stand firm and not sin. The more society gives in to temptation or compromises, the more it normalizes sin, the more likely it's going to be that we'll capitulate in those areas. Standing for God can and will make us feel isolated and lonely and maybe even like a pariah. But God is supposed to be enough for us. I know that's hard. But if we didn't have anything else, even if we're standing all alone against the rest of society, knowledge of God and what he's done for us and reliance on him is where we're supposed to be at as Christians. In our hearts, we're supposed to be there and we're supposed to be content in all circumstances. And that's exactly how Satan gets us to sin indirectly, by having unbelievers and the world normalize sin and having us think it's normal. And that's because we're not totally sanctified yet. So it's hard to contemplate losing everything and feeling content because we have God. Horatio Spafford got this. After unexpected financial ruin, he lost all his investments in the Great Chicago Fire, and then two years later, he lost all four of his daughters in a shipwreck in the Atlantic. He wrote the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul, one of my favorites. What gave Spafford that perspective? It's exactly what you just said, Chris. According to the song, it's the assurance that Christ has shed his blood on the cross for the forgiveness of his sin in order to save his soul. And it's hard for people to understand this. And sometimes God doesn't even give us this strength until we need it. Absolutely. Blaise Pascal said, There's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man, which cannot be filled by any created thing, but only by God, the Creator, made known through Jesus. And Augustine said in his confessions, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. You can't understand these things unless you're saved. You just can't. No. You can't. So Babylon, the great seducer, and Rome, the beastly persecuting ruler of John's time, are the images John uses here. 
but they're representative of worldly seducers and world powers all through history until Jesus returns. Next, the text tells us that the angel takes John, conveyed by the Spirit in a vision, to a wilderness to get the full picture of this prostitute. Here, he sees a woman adorned in purple and scarlet, decked out with beautiful gold and jewels. She looks pretty at first, but then we're told she's holding a goblet of sin from her immorality. Not only that, but the name on her forehead is the mother of all prostitutes and obscenities in the world. <laughs> Not so pretty. Not so pretty. <laughs> yeah, the angel starts out this section saying to John, come and I will show you. And then he shows him the realities of Babylon, the filthy underbelly of the sins she's promoting that leads to spiritual death. She's contrasted with what we're going to see in chapter 21, where the angel's going to say, come and I will show you again. But that time, he'll be showing the true bride to John. Here's the counterfeit bride in chapter 17. And in chapter 21, we'll see the bride of Christ, who's the church. At first, Babylon looks very much the same as the true bride. But Babylon's a fake. She's in a desert. And we're going to see in a few weeks that's contrasted by the river of life where the lamb and his bride are. Babylon's wearing purple and scarlet while the true bride wears bright, pure white. Babylon is outwardly adorned with gold and jewels. But we'll see that the true bride is adorned with gold that's been refined through the fires of trial and tribulation. And her radiance is from the glory of God. The last thing is a picture of God's people who are refined to be more and more like Jesus, where godly wives are told to adorn themselves inwardly more than outwardly. And we see this in 1 Peter 3 and in the Proverbs 31 woman, the wife of noble character, which, by the way, is a picture of the church. And we did a whole podcast episode on that. So it's talking about men and women, not just women. Inward adornment of the Christian is throughout the whole Bible. Exactly. And there are more things that we could mention about this contrast between the two, the counterfeit bride and the true bride. But I want to mention one more. Babylon is sitting on a red beast with seven heads and ten horns. This is the beast from chapter 13 and the ones from Daniel 7, which we know were real world kingdoms with rulers like Antiochus for Epiphanes, who was horrific to God's people on that day. So here's a picture of the harlot who represents power, wealth, and all kinds of worldly temptation, sitting on wicked rulers who want to destroy the church. These are contrasted with the true bride, who is the church, who sits on the firm foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, as we're told in Ephesians 2.20. Babylon, as the similar but counterfeit picture of Jesus' bride, the church, may be why some futurists believe Babylon is a false religion or a heretical church that will follow the Antichrist, as they would say, at the very end times. Some Protestants, mostly in the past, used to think of Babylon as the Catholic church that's riding on the beast, which they saw as the Antichrist. Certainly, as you and I know, Chris, people are deceived by things that look like the church, but aren't. We've done podcasts on it. So, those things could be types of the things that's talked about here. Right. And we do see this, sadly, all the time. Those types of churches can be seductive in their own way. Churches that make Christianity seem more about you than about God. Or the Catholic Church, that's tempting because you really don't need to rely and trust on Jesus alone when you can say a few Hail Marys and light a few candles to get rid of your sin. So you're right. They could be types of Babylons. And of course... We want to point out that some take this to be a literal new city of Babylon, but that doesn't really fit. So let's no. keep going. Babylon is drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyr. Power hungry leaders and governments who persecute and kill God's people and they take extreme pleasure in it. That's why it says she's drunk on it. And haven't we seen this since the church first started and millions of times since then? Don't we see governors taking perverse pleasure in closing churches down? And it's going to continue until Jesus comes back. And it's going to get more intense, like the, all the judgments are. So let's read the next section, starting at the second half of verse 6. It says, When I saw her, I marveled greatly. But the angel said to me, Why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with the seven heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not 
and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman is seated. There are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain only for a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth but belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the lamb, and the lamb will conquer them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. So the text says that John marveled greatly at this woman and the beast. Yeah, and concordances say that marvel means to have wonder or to have astonishment or amazement or possibly even some level of admiration. So I think the angel is probably rebuking John here because John's a believer and believers shouldn't be marveling at any worldly stuff. That's what the wicked do, according to verse 8. We're supposed to be different. In 2 Thessalonians 1.10, Paul says that when Jesus comes, he'll be marveled at by believers. Amen. So let's talk about this beast in verse 8. This beast is red, referring back to the dragon in chapter 12, who personifies Satan or evil and who was trying to kill the church. And also says this beast is full of blasphemous names. The beast is out to do the work of Satan. We mentioned already he's the same beast that we saw in chapter 13 with the mortal wound that was healed, which made the whole earth marvel at him. Let's talk about this next part. It's a little hard. Verse 8 says the beast was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. So shed some light on that, Rose. Yeah, this is pretty complex. But to understand this, we should start by reminding ourselves of the fourfold pattern of Christ's life. He lived, he died, he rose from the dead, and he ascended. Now, see how what's said about the beast mimics Jesus' fourfold pattern. It mimics it, but it's different because other than the he was, every aspect of the beast is opposite of Jesus, showing that he's a counterfeit. Jesus ascended to the throne, whereas the beast is headed for destruction. And moving on to verse 9, this is one of those already not yet fulfillments. The seven heads of the beast are seven mountains. Because the woman is seated on them and there are seven means it's worldwide, like we said earlier. The beast in John's day was the Roman Empire. Nero suffered a wound that some thought looked mortal, but then he came back stronger. But remember, from chapter 13, which we covered in Release the Kraken episode, the mortal wounds which have been healed means the evil keeps coming back. The verse goes on to say that the seven heads of the beast are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen, One is, and the other has not yet come. And when he does come, he'll remain for only a little while. Let's unpack that, Chris. Okay. The fact that they're kings represents their power. Who are the five who've fallen, the one who is, and the other who can only remain for a little while? Are these references to seven kings? Well, scholars have tried to pin these titles on different world leaders over and over again without coming to any consensus. But really, we shouldn't focus on it. Because there are seven of them, seven of them, that's the number of perfect completeness. So the actual point here is that throughout this whole period between Jesus' first and second coming, there will be whatever God determines is a perfect, complete number of leaders all over the earth doing the evil work of the dragon Satan, all who are fulfilling God's purposes. And Satan is going to rise from the bottomless pit. When Jesus triumphed over Satan with his perfect, sinless life, his death and his resurrection— It bound Satan so that he couldn't deceive the nations for a period of time. There's a loss of some power here. He and his demons weren't rendered totally ineffective yet, but they are limited for a certain period of time. At some point, though, 
Satan will be released from the bottomless pit and things will get bad. Remember the locusts from chapter 9. Also, remember how the wicked thought they'd won for a short period of time back in chapter 14. I think it was three and a half days. That's what's being reiterated here when it says he must remain for only a little while. Right. The gospel message will spread while Satan's bound. But the fact that he's going to be released again, that goes against the idea that we're going to have some sort of Christianized society on earth and things are going to be really nice and pleasant here for a while. Not going to happen. And this definitely obliterates that idea. Let's deal with the next part. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth but belongs to the seven and it goes to destruction. This can make your head hurt, but it's a play on words. Jesus is talked about in the Bible as the one who is and who was and who is to come. But in some of these chapters, he's referred to as the one who is and who was, period. And why is that? It's because those verses are talking about a time when Jesus has come back again. And the beast is described as the beast that was and is not. Because he's the counterfeit who's going to destruction when Jesus gets here, so the beast is going to be no more. Absolutely. Hallelujah and amen to that. (laughs) It also says this beast is an eight but belongs to a seven. So let's throw out a few things what this might be. They're all bad. This could represent the totality of evil or an excess of evil unlike we've ever seen before. Or it could be showing the complete incompleteness and the complete counterfeitness of Satan and his kingdom. Satan's the counterfeit eight. He actually belongs to the seven. There's something else though, Rose. Yeah, this is very complex. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time to really dive into this. But the number eight symbolizes creation or new beginnings or recreation. Examples of eight are there was eight people in Noah's Ark to restart the earth. Uh, Infant boys were circumcised on the eighth day, symbolizing being part of the covenant of God's people. And there's lots of other eights like that. So this could be a renewal of oppression in some way. And I wish we had more time, but like you said, all the indications are and all the meanings are that it's bad. So going on to verse 12, we're told 10 kings are given power for one hour. That's not a literal 10 kings. It's a complete number of kings or world leaders, whatever God determines it to be. And it's only one hour because Satan's future time and terrible assault on the Lamb and his church will be short-lived. It also says these leaders are of one mind and they hand their power and authority over to the beast. They're all be so united in their purpose of destroying anything that has to do with Jesus and his church that they'll be willing to hand over their authority to somebody else, the beast, to make war on the lamb and his church. We won't be fighting in a literal battle alongside Jesus against world leaders at the end. And we've, we've kind of said this, Chris, but we need to reiterate this. Jesus has already won that battle. It's finished. It just has not been brought to full culmination yet. The chosen and faithful with the lamb in verse 14 are believers. The lamb is called the word of God in chapter 19's battle description, as we're going to see. We said this a couple episodes before, but it bears repeating. The sword believers fight with, according to Ephesians 6, 17, is the word of God. We are fighting against sin. As Ephesians 6 says, we're to stand firm. It's the word of God that we use to fight temptation. It's the word of God that keeps us strong in the face of fear from the beast. We have to know it. We have to eat it, as we talked about earlier. And we have to make sure we're understanding it the way it was meant to be understood. That's why being under sound biblical teaching is crucial. Absolutely. And that goes right along with the fact that those 10 evil kings are united in thought and purpose. And believers are to be of one mind too. Let me explain that a little bit. We're to have unity, but not only in the way we treat each other, we're to have unity in our doctrine at a minimum on the essentials. I just want to say this here. That familiar speak the truth in love passage gets used all the time as a way to lovingly correct your brother or sister in the faith about some sin they're committing. But that passage is about having correct theology and doctrine. I'll just read it. Ephesians 4, 11, 15 says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until we attain to the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood. 
to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. That passage is about having good theology and doctrine. We're supposed to be united in it. So let's read the last three verses of chapter 17. And the angel said to me, the waters that you saw where the prostitute is seating and the peoples and multitudes and nations and languages and the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. Okay, the beast and the ten kings end up hating the prostitute. They're going to end up hating the luxurious, glamorous lavishness that lures people to them. And in the end, they'll turn on Babylon. That sounds crazy, but we see it happening. The crazy thing is, it doesn't sound crazy. That's exactly right. But the text says that God put it in their minds to hand over their authority to the beast, a hater of the prostitute. The counterfeit bridegroom kills the counterfeit bride. We see this all over scripture, where God's people think they'll have to fight their enemies, who often far outnumber them, and they could never actually fight against them. But when it's time for battle, they see their enemies have turned on themselves. King Saul found the Philistines attacking themselves in 1 Samuel 14. Gideon's army found the Midianites doing the same thing. Seir, Moab, and Ammon, three of Judah's enemies, came together against Judah in allegiance with each other. What happened? The Ammonites and the Moabites turned on Seir, destroying them. And then they all turned on each other. And we get glimpses of that today. We see it in political parties that are divided by some wanting to keep the status quo and hold the normal party lines while others in the party wanting sweeping change of the whole government system. What they end up with is people walking away, like it's been happening in the walk away movement of the Democrat Party here in the United States. And there's division among the rest on many issues. I mean, just recently we saw Diane Feinberg, a high ranking Democrat, treat a Catholic Supreme Court nominee very civilly and actually very kindly eventually. And then at the end, she hugged a Republican, Lindsey Graham, after the proceedings. And people from her party called for her to retire because of it. But it's not even okay to, to be civil to the other side anymore. Or they turn on each other. And it's getting worse. How many times have we said to each other that there almost seems to be a spiritual element to the hatred we see today in politics? But the good news No world kingdom lasts forever. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Citizens have opposing worldviews and countries break apart to form smaller countries. Allies turn on each other and form other alliances. Jesus said, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste and a divided household falls. The beast and the kings turn on Babylon the prostitute and they utterly destroy her. They destroy her because it's their nature to destroy. They're fulfilling God's purposes in doing it, but he never causes anyone to sin. He doesn't have to. Why use the beast to judge the prostitute? Because there are no righteous nations to judge her. There aren't any righteous nations. The wicked are left to their sinful natures. Without the Holy Spirit regenerating a person's heart, that's the state they're in. And... They're going to harden their hearts more and more against anything that's righteous. And God may even harden their hearts even more than that, like he did with Pharaoh. And Chris, I want to point something out that I heard in a sermon on Revelation. The rise of evil at the end of time is not the fault of the church. Persecution in your country doesn't happen because the church didn't pray enough or because the church didn't keep prayer in schools or because the church neglected their duty in some other way. Christians who are suffering persecution in other countries aren't suffering persecution because they didn't pray enough or because they didn't have enough faith. Christians in the United States and other places where there's freedom to worship don't have that freedom because they're wonderfully faithful and diligent. 
God is fulfilling his purposes throughout the world, using both righteous deeds and sinful ones as part of working out his plan. Absolutely. Important thing to get your theology right in that area. Let's go on to chapter 18. The fall of Babylon is what it's called. It says, After this I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She's become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. This is a funeral dirge from Isaiah chapter 21. As we've already said, no country is immune to the temptations of power and wealth, wealth that's often made through luxurious living of the powerful on the backs of the poor under their rule. But it's important to say that all people, whether rich or poor, ruler or those under them, are all tempted by her. I'll read the next four verses. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. For her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back as she herself has paid back others, and repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed. As she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning, since in her heart she says, I said as queen, I am no widow, and mourning I shall never see. For this reason her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire. For mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. Well, here's a call for the church to come out of Babylon. This is a call for the church not to align themselves with Babylon. Don't get sucked in. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. We can't avoid the world, and there are good things God gave us to enjoy in it, even though the counterfeits have distorted some of those good things and used them for sinful purposes. And don't we see that? Like sex, for instance. We have to be smart. The counterfeits will use good things in deceptive ways, like the fact that all lives matter because humans are made in the image of God. That's a true fact. But this year, that was totally distorted by an organization trying to push a political agenda. And what happened? Christians promoted it, thinking they were doing a good thing, when in reality, if you look at the underbelly of the organization's true mission, most of what they stand for goes directly against biblical teaching. So be smart. Chris, you want to read the rest? Absolutely. And the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They'll stand far off in fear of her torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn for her since no one buys their cargo anymore. Cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloths, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots, and slaves, that is human souls. The first fruit for which your soul longed for has gone from you, and all your delicacies and your splendors are lost on you, never to be found again. The merchants of these wares who gained wealth from her will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud. Alas, alas, for the great city that was clothed in fine linen, in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, with jewels and with pearls. For in a single hour all this wealth has been laid waste, and all the shipmasters and seafaring men and sailors and all whose trade is on the sea stood far off and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city was like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads as they wept and mourned, crying out, Alas, alas, for the great city where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth. For in a single hour she has been laid waste. 
Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon the great city be thrown down with violence and be found no more. And the sound of harpists, musicians, of flute players, and trumpeters will be heard in you no more. And a craftsman of any craft will be found in you no more. And the sound of the mill will be heard in you no more. And the light of the lamp will shine in you no more. And the voice of the bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more. For your merchants were with the great ones of the earth, and all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of saints and of all who had been slain on the earth. A long passage, but John describes the mourning from all the people who participated in the sins of Babylon, the prostitute, because she's gone. Everyone who profited from her power, the workers, the merchants who got rich, the transportation industry who got rich, they're all mourning because she's gone and with her, so are the riches and power. Yeah, and at this point, all the normal pleasant things of everyday life are gone. Music is gone. The sound of work is gone. Food is gone. Light is gone. All of it's gone. And if you notice, so are the voices of the bridegroom and the bride. No more voice from the Lord. No more voice from the church. They're not getting called to repent. They're, they don't have a chance anymore. There is nothing pleasant. And unfortunately, that's where we need to leave you today. If you have any questions or comments about this episode, you can always contact us at Proverbs910Ministries.com or our email, Proverbs910Ministries at gmail.com. And if you like what you're hearing so far in this series on Revelation, please leave a review on whatever platform you're listening. Have a blessed day, everyone. Bye.